Okay, I guess then we can start, Daniel. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm ready. Great. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming back. Um, so today I want, to, I want to go over some work about motor learning and particularly looking at how we learn repertoires. And again, I'd be very happy to have interruptions at any point on, on this work. So the idea is that actually we don't just learn one thing through our lives. You have to learn many things. And we can think of, you know, learning discrete things, for example, as we handle um, like tea, our hand can be in free space or the hand can interact with a kettle and it can be in free space again and it can interact with a teapot and so on. And so we can think of these as different contexts. As you go between these different discrete um, states, discrete contexts, the dynamics of our arm changes effectively. So we have to adjust the properties of our control when we're handling a teapot separate from a non-free space. And we could label these by hand as, you know, when the hand's in free space, it's green here. And when the hand's handling the kettle, it's this cyan. And then within each of those contexts, we can think of different states. So as you pour from the kettle, you're changing the weight of the kettle, so the state is changing. Or as you swish the teapot around to warm it again, the state is changing. And so what I want to talk about today is really the rules by which our brains create separate memories for these sorts of events. Um, so what are those rules? And I'm going to first of all start off by going over some experimental work to sort of set you up for the model. And then I'm going to describe a new model we've developed, the COIN model, which deals exactly with this problem in a sort of Bayesian way. How do you, when do you create a memory? How do you express the memories you've got and how do you update memories? And I'll talk about experimental tests of the model on new and existing data. So yesterday we talked about different forms of learning um, and I'm going to focus today on adaptation. So adaptation is where you handle an object, for example, and therefore you have to adapt your motor commands to the physical properties of the objects. Um, I just want to point out that all these sorts of learning apply to reaching, manipulation of walking, balance, speech, eye movements, and so on. But we're going to focus on reaching because that's a, the main paradigm which has been used um, to study adaptation. Okay, so adaptation to novel dynamics is, is, it requires us to um, change the relation between the motor command and the consequences by applying forces. So, you know, you could do it by putting a weight on the arm or holding an object in your hand. It's been studied by taking people to space so they're in zero gravity, so the dynamics change. You can ask people to hold onto gyroscopes or be in rotating rooms. And all these things change the you know, properties of the body so that you have to adapt. The trouble with them all is they don't have precise, the sort of precise control we would like to be able to um, test experimental ideas. So we get a lot of work building robotic devices where the robot can basically simulate novel dynamics and perturb the arm. So, you know, we can have ones where you hold onto the object 2D or three-dimensional robots. And the one I'm going to talk about today is all the studies I'm going to talk about are done with a two-dimensional robot. Um, here's a participant um, in one of our rigs. And the idea is this robot is a, a, a device that can move in two dimensions. So it can move in two dimensions, it can track the movement, but it's also got torque motors here. And those motors can then generate forces at the hand. So we can arbitrarily generate forces, we can stimulate objects, we can stimulate um, you know, force fields, we can make the arm move passively. We have a lot of control. This is a side view. And what we do is we have a, a monitor facing downwards and a mirror here so that images appear in the plane of the movement. And so we can give people virtual targets or feedback of their own limb um, in the plane of the movement. So they move around and they can see what they're doing effectively um, by what we project into the mirror. So we first of all ask subjects just to make a movement with the robot turned off. And I, I'm not showing you the robot now. And if you do that, oops, with the robot turned off. And we're going to call that P0. So P stands for a perturbation. Z0 here stands for a no perturbation. We can also then apply a perturbation. The typical one we're going to apply is one where the force in the x and y direction is some gain times this matrix times the x and y velocity. And if you plot out the forces as a function of velocity, it looks like this. So if you don't move, you get no force. The faster you move, the further you are from the origin, the bigger the force, it scales linearly. And the force always acts at right angles to your direction of motion. So if you move to the right, it's going to push you up. If you move up, it's going to push you to the left. So if you were to make this movement here, you're going to have forces pushing you to the left. Okay, so we call this a counterclockwise viscous curl field. Okay, so this is nice. It's something you've never experienced before. So using the robots, we can give you experience, which we can be pretty much certain you haven't experienced outside the lab. Whereas if we gave you an object or tool, you may well have seen that sort of object outside the lab. And so this is going to perturb people, and we're going to call it P plus 
because it's a perturbation in one direction. And we can also apply the same perturbation, but with the gain now sign changed, so it applies in the opposite direction, and we'll call that P minus. Okay. So here's some examples of just movements made. So here's the movement made in P0, nice straight line movements. If you apply the P plus field early on, you see people are perturbed to the left, not surprisingly, and they correct during the movement to get onto the target. After experiencing it for maybe half an hour, they make nice straight line movements in P plus. And if we suddenly turn P plus off without telling the subject, we see this after effect. They now make a curve movement the other way. So participants are sort of learning something about the force field as they experience it. One way to, to measure learning is to measure the deviation um, of the trajectory from a straight line, so the maximum perpendicular error. And if we plot that uh, here, this shows you a sort of typical trace. Before perturbation, it's almost zero. When you're perturbed, it becomes large, and it goes down over the course of an hour or so. When you turn the force field off, it becomes large again, and participants de-adapt. The trouble is of using this measure of learning is twofold. One, it doesn't allow us to quantify um, how much of the force field you've learned. It's not easy to say you know, you've learned half the force field or a third of the force field. And moreover, it's problematic because okay, it's problematic because if you co-contract, stiffen up your arm, you can learn under this force field. Okay, you can learn this way, but that's not true learning. So we want a way to measure true learning. So we don't like to use this particular measure. So a new technique has been developed in the field um, in which we do something rather different. What we do is occasionally, um, every maybe 10 trials, rather than produce the force field, we effectively generate a channel. So the idea is the robot now doesn't produce a force field. It actually constrains the hand in a straight line from the start point to the target. And it does that by generating a stiff spring in one dimension. So it doesn't um, have any resistance in the direction of the movement, but it constrains the movement to a straight line to the target. From the participant's point of view, it's like they did a really good job. They make a lovely straight movement. But the nice thing for us is we can measure the forces the subject produces into the channel wall as a measure of learning. So maybe they produce this force into the channel wall, and we can work out what the ideal force would have been to compensate for the force field. So given the velocity they move, we know what the force field would have been, and it would have been this for example, and therefore we can quantify learning as being 30%, 50 or 75% as they go through. So we can now convert um, this data into how much of the force field have we learned. And this shows the data from these trials. Now, these are from all exposure trials, here we only get them from these channel trials, what we call PC, maybe one in every 10, so it's sparser data, but we can now measure the percentage adaptation and you can see it starts at zero and goes up to about 70% here. So we're gonna focus on this sort of adaptation. So let me describe a couple of experiments we've done um, using these sorts of paradigms. And all these experiments really to ask the question, how do you learn two different force fields at the same time? So we have a participant to reach to a target under P plus force field. And when this little light is on here, they're going to get P plus. And on other trials, the light will be on on the other side, and they're going to get P minus. And we're going to randomly interleave these two force fields, P plus and P minus. And this light tells them which they're going to get. And you would think cognitively they could then learn to switch between these force fields. So I'm showing these um, separated in the space here, just so you can see them. They're really in the same point in space. And then occasionally, every 10 trials or so, we do a channel trial with the light on the left or the right to measure learning. And if we look at learning over the course of about an hour, effectively we get no learning at all. So participants can't learn to switch between these two force fields based on a static visual cue. Um, even if you tell them the cue is relevant, it tells them the force field. And, and that's been shown many times, it's very hard to associate a color or, or a light you know, with a force field. It's possible if you train people for days, but in general, it's hard to learn. But we can change the experiment just a little. We can now make this light relevant to the task. So rather than starting here and going through the force field, they now start at either the left or the right um, um, light. They move into this point and then go through the force field, or they move in from the right and go through the force field. And now the direction they move in from is predictive of the force field they're going to get. So if they come in from the left, they're going to get the P plus. They come in from the right, they get the P minus. And in different groups of subjects, we're going to make them wait for different amounts of time at this point. So if we make them wait for one second, 
thousand milliseconds, we see no learning, it doesn't help them. But if they only have to wait for half a second here, we begin to see more learning. And if they only have to wait for 150, or only the briefest amount of time, zero milliseconds, we see substantial learning. So what this suggests is that if the arm is doing something different in the half second or so before it has to go through this force field, it effectively can learn separate motor memories. It can use that as some sort of contextual cue to separate out the motor memories. But if it's more than a half a second ago, it doesn't have any, any use in the system. So this suggests to us that the past is an important cue to separate out the memories for different skills. And if the past is important, we wondered whether the future could also be important. So we ran a group who basically saw again a target which was irrelevant to their task, but it told them what force they were going to get. And they just make a movement um, through a P plus or P minus, and the field field is indicated by this target. And again, not surprisingly, they can't learn anything. But in the second group, we asked them to follow through the movement. So they go through the force field and then follow through to the left or follow through to the right without the force field at this point and ask, could the fact that you're going to do a different follow throughs allow them to learn separate memories? And in this case, we see substantial learning. So it suggests that if you're going to do something different in the future, then effectively it allows you to separate your motor memories. Yes, question. Yes. So if you asked the participants what they did or what they um, uh, perceived, are they able to tell you that you know they are uh, they saw that these two tasks are different? Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, these were different subjects, um, but it's obvious that the two tasks are different in some sense. I mean, this one they know they're just making movement and stopping. This one they know they have to follow through. Different in what way? And, uh, and this one they just learn it naturally. This one they can't learn it. But they, I don't think they, they I don't think they can express why they can learn it. No. Okay. Is, is that what you mean? I mean, they, yeah, yeah. No, if they're, I if they're think, actually strategizing in some way. No, I, I think this is not a strategy. I think this is just a natural consequence of, of following through that you learn this. I don't think it's any, I, I, I don't think, and I don't think people know that had this group don't know that had they followed through, they'd have been able to learn it. I don't think they know that. I don't think people okay. are aware. Okay. So this is interesting. So it suggests that what you do after you do a skill actually affects the way that skill is stored. And that's sort of interesting because, um, you know, if you think about sports, you're always told to follow through in sports, but following through is a bit weird because when you let go of a ball or you uh, make contact with the ball, whatever happens to that ball after, you, you, the follow through can't really affect. Um, I've got a question, so, yes. I see a hand up, is there a question? Huh. So I, I wanted to ask like, is there any temporal dependence in this case as well? Like if you ask them to move the, I mean, in, yeah, that, in the, in the yeah. previous case. I understand. Um, we, we didn't test that. I mean, you're asking if we made them do the follow through after half a second. Um, yes. Um, the, the, follow, the follow through effect is much weaker than the lead in effect. So it's much less learning. So we're, our assumptions would be that it would tail off if we made them um, wait. We, we didn't do that um, just because it requires another group of eight subjects for each delay. We, we didn't test it. Um, our assumption is yes. Okay. But we don't know the answer. Okay. 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 okay so, so in follow through, if what I've just told you is true, um, if you make the same follow through for a skill, so let's say I'm learning just a P plus now, and I make the same follow through each time, then effectively um, I should be storing that in one memory. On the other hand, if I make uh, uh, learn the skill P plus, make a different follow through each time, then effectively I'm going to be storing. I'll come to the question in a minute. I'll be storing that. P plus in different memories. So the prediction of what I've just told you is that if you do this, you should learn a single skill faster than if you do this. And we tested that in, in two groups, one of which did a consistent follow through in red, just learning a single force field, one who did a variable follow through. And again, the group who did the consistent follow through learned substantially faster. I mean, it, it, this is a simple thing, just learning one field, but they were faster, suggesting that they were consolidating that learning. So it suggests that one reason for a follow through, and there are many others, I think, is that you might be then consolidating that learning in one memory. And I just want to finally say that in terms of this, this part is that, you know, what, what is it about follow through which allows you to learn the skills? This is actually just a replication, two new groups, a no follow through group and a follow through group with the learning. But we can ask, is it just executing the follow through that matters? So here we have a group who start the movement in P plus or P minus, but they don't have a follow through target. But halfway through the movement, we turn on the follow through target and they have to follow through to the left or the right. 
Okay, so they never get to see the follow through before they start the movement, but they get to execute it. So in theory, they could learn to sort of associate this with the force that they got. And then we assess adaptation again with channel trials with the follow through target on from the beginning of the trial. And this group, we see no learning at all. So simply executing a follow through doesn't help you. And then we have another group who effectively plan a follow through, but never make it. Okay. So in this group, the target is on from the beginning, uh, and that indicates which field they're going to get, and they start making the movement, but halfway through the movement, we turn off the target, and they have to abort the trial at the green target. So they can plan the follow-through, but they never make the follow-through when the force field is on. And to encourage them to plan the follow-through, we have many of these trials where, again, the follow through targets on from the beginning, but they're in a channel. So they get to follow through, but there's nothing to learn. So that encourages them to plan on every trial because many trials, they do follow through, but just on those ones, there's nothing to learn. And what we see in this group is they learn just as well as full follow through. So it suggests to us what's critical about separating out these memories and, and these sorts of tasks is that effectively um, you plan different movements. When you plan different movements, you put the brain in a different state effectively. And that allows you to associate those different states with different um, forces. It's not the physical location of the hand that matters at all, um, which is which is really interesting to us. So it's just a recent past and probably, although we can't prove it, recent future actions are important in sort of segregating motor memories and that planning is actually more important execution for these sorts of memories. But I don't want you going away thinking that the only way you can separate out memories is through, you know, lead in and follow through. Um, you know, for example, we are um, great tool users. Um, animals have developed amazing sets of tools and each have got unique tools which they use. We as humans can adopt all these tools and more. And one question we've been interested in is when you operate on a tool, are you learning it in a way that a physicist would, you know, F equals MA, or are you doing something rather different? And the idea is that, you know, when you use a cup, when you drink from the lip of the cup, What's important is the soft compliant relationship between your lip and the cup, which has very different dynamics from when you put the base of the cup down on the table, which has frictional properties. And so maybe you're not learning a cup holistically, but learning it in terms of the points on the object you're trying to control. So we had a hypothesis that when you manipulate objects, you worry about the different points you're trying to control in the object and maybe can associate different dynamics with those different points. And so here's a very simple experiment where we have a virtual object in our scene. Um, here you can see the robotic handle and the subject's handle. This is what the participant actually sees. And this object is going to translate with the robot. So if they move around, it's going to translate with them. And you can see a target here, and you can see different points on the object. And we have two groups of subjects. One group are told when the left target is on, move the left point on the object to the target. And when the right target is on, move the right point on the object to the target. So both these movements require the same movement, just a straight ahead movement. And we apply P minus for these trials and P plus for these. And again, we randomly interleave them, okay? So we're asking is, are you able to learn these two force fields if you think you're controlling or told to control different points on the object? And we can contrast that with a, a, the identical sort of system where again, there's a target on the left and the right, but now it's irrelevant. They're told to move the center uh, point always to this target. And again, we change P minus and P plus. So these two groups experience the same movements, always a straight ahead movement, the same fields, P plus and P minus. The only difference is this group are told to move the center point to a target and this moves to the left or the right point to the target. And what we find is that this group learn nothing, whereas this group learn a huge amount. So by somehow attending to the left and right points on this tool, you can now learn these different force fields. And it's got nothing to do with eye movements. We've run this with the eyes fixating and the eyes free to move. It seems to be that you can control these different points. And we did some generalization studies where we showed that it really is the point on the tool that matters rather than the target or where the hand is. Um, so it suggests that we can actually control points on an object can be associated with different dynamics for the same movement. And We'll come back to that later on, thinking of this as a sensory cue. It's a way we can cue subjects to different dynamics. I'm about to move on to the model. Are there any questions on any of those experiments before I move on? OK. So you know, throughout your life, you handle many objects. Um, and 
what we will try to do here is develop a simplified abstract model of motor adaptation. It's going to be very simple, but it's going to be quite rich nevertheless. We're going to have scalar states, scalar observations, and scalar actions. So we're going to have one dimension. It's going to be a trial level model. So it's going to model the sort of experiments I've just talked about, where from trial to trial, you learn something. But I think the core computational problem we address here really applies to much more complex motor learning. But at the moment, you'll see that actually the complexity of the model, even for the scalar version, is, is quite substantial. And this model was you know, primarily developed by a PhD student, James Heald in the group, uh, and Matty Lengel and I went along for the ride on this work, which was very exciting. So we call it um, the COIN model. COIN stands for contextual inference because key to this model is estimating what context you're in. And we like the word coin because it's got the probabilistic nature. It's going to be a probabilistic model. So in the true Bayesian way, I'm going to describe the generative model. So the idea here is the generative model is how your brain thinks the world's going to generate data. So I'm going to describe the generative model. Then once you've got the generative model, we can describe how you're going to use inference to infer what's happening in the model and then compare that with data. So the idea here is the world can be in one of a number, any number of contexts at a time. So it's in one context at a time. So here it's in the blue context and then stays in the blue context. And then it goes to the red, it stays in the red and goes to the orange. And you can think of these contexts as different objects, maybe the hands free in space and then handling the teapot and then handling the uh, cup and so on. Okay. And so this is going to transition as a Markovian process, as we'll see in a moment. Okay. Each context can emit a sensory cue. So we could imagine that, you know, teacup is associated with a, you know, a visual image of a teacup, for example. And there's a relationship between the context and the sensory cues you see. So you might see visual, you know, visual objects. But critically, each context is also associated with a state. So this might be the weight of this context one, the weight of the, of, of, um, the, the um, kettle. And the weight of kettle can change over time you know, as you empty it or fill it. And here, for example, is the weight of a sugar bowl. And here's maybe something else. OK. And the idea is that what you get to experience after movement, the feedback of your movement, is going to depend on which context is active and the state of that context. So if the red context is active, you don't get to experience the blue state. That's why this line is gray, but you get to experience the red state. Okay, And here, when the orange is active, you only experience the orange state. Nevertheless, while you're observing them, all the other states continue to evolve over time. So this is a, a sort of a version of a switching state space model. And so the idea is that motor learning, then, is online recursive inference of everything you want to know inside this model. You as a human only get to observe these things. You get to observe sensory cues. And we think of sensory cues as things which don't depend on your action, like the appearance of an object. And state feedback, that's sort of proprioceptive or visual feedback of your movement. You get to experience all those. But your job is to estimate everything up here. Um, and that's what motor learning is. And let me be sort of precise about the things you want to estimate in the model. So we can break things down into variables you want to estimate and parameters. So variables are things you expect to change in this model. OK, so what the model expects to change, whereas parameters are things that this model thinks are, are fixed. Um, your beliefs about them might change, but in your generative model, they're fixed numbers. So the variables are things like which context is currently active. OK, am I in the blue, the red, or, 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 or the orange? That's something you'd want to estimate. And you'd also want to say, um, what's the current state of each context, which is going to change? You know, what's the state of the red context, the blue context, and so on? So those are things which change in the model, and you want to estimate. And then there are parameters. How many contexts have I seen? Um, what determines the context transition probabilities? What determines the Q emission? And what are the state transition dynamics? So what determines how these states change in each of those? Now, those are all fixed in the model, but you're, well, because you're estimating them, in real time, your estimates are going to change. So your belief about them will change with time. So that's what the system has to do. Now, in order to specify how it's going to do it, I have to put priors over everything I care about in this model. So the next few slides, I'm going to go through the priors that we put on the model. And once we've got the generative model and the priors, that fully specifies the model. And that effectively specifies the inference process. So let me go through the priors on this. OK, so the first thing is these context transition according to um, a transition matrix. OK, so there's a matrix of rows and columns which says what's probably going from context one to context two and context three to context two and so on. And the way we do that, and the details aren't that important, um, we, we do, we have a three hyperparameters 
which gives us a prior over this matrix. Now, critically, this is a non-parametric model. So parametric models would say, I think there are going to be 10 contexts in the world, and I'll fix the 10 contexts and learn it. But that's not how our lives are like. We start off, you know, we're born, we don't know how many contexts we're going to experience. And as we gather more data, we're going to add more memories to our repertoire. And so in a non-parametric model, the number of contexts can increase as you get more data in, in a, in a, in a, um, in a um, principled way. So effectively, in a non-parametric model, we're allowed infinite number of contexts um, to, start off, to start off with, and we just add contexts as we go. And so the way this works is in a hierarchical way. We first of all create global probability for each context. And the way we do that is what's called a stick breaking algorithm. You can think of this unit length thing as a stick, and we break pieces off the stick with a rule, and we break infinite off, and that gives us our global probabilities for each context. So it says the blue context is the most probable, followed by this mauve one, followed by the, the, the red one. That's our prior over the, the probabilities of different contexts. And from that, we can use another parameter to generate the transition properties. So what I'm showing you here, this is a, sort of showing you a matrix in a sort of unusual format. This is from context two. This says, if I'm in context one, I'm most likely to transition to context to the blue context, uh, maybe then the second likely the mauve and then, and then the red. And this shows the distribution. So with these three parameters, and the third one is the stickiness that you tend to stay in the same context, we have a nice, um, we have a nice prior over context transitions, which is very flexible. Okay. We simply use a very similar prior over these Q emissions. So the Q emission says how probable for are different visual objects in the world. So maybe cups are more probable than sugar bowls. And again, it tells me what I'm likely to see in different contexts. So in context six, maybe um, you know, the cup Q is very high. And here we have two hyperparameters because there's no concept of stickiness. Okay. So we put these two priors over these two features. Simpler is that we put a prior over how these states transition. And we have a very simple model of states transition that the J state basically decays away with time. So we have a, a retention parameter here and it can drift and it has noise, okay? So the retention of the drift is specific to um, the particular um, um, state context and it can be different from each. Uh, the noise properties are gonna be the same across all possible contexts. And then we put priors on those and we very simply, the um, retention is a truncated normal because it can't go below zero or above one um, with two parameters and the drift is just a zero mean Gaussian prior, okay? So we put a prior on that. The prior is the same for each of these, but as you go through learning, they'll end up having different beliefs for different um, states that the A and Ds are different. And then finally, we get state feedback. What you experience here is the state of the active context plus noise. So when we come to fit data, if we have an experiment without sensory cues, that means without these sensory cues here, there are seven parameters to fit, and with cues, there'll be eight parameters fit, um, which is a reasonable number of parameters, but it's quite a flexible model. Are there any questions on the generative model before I move on? Was that all understandable or all totally not? No questions. Okay. So let's just talk about the inference. So once we set up that, of course, we want to do inference. We want to say, given the sequence of sensory cues and state feedback, what's my best estimate of all these things? Now, that's sort of an intractable problem because it's too, it's too difficult. So we actually use a, a particle learning method to estimate that. And actually a lot of the project was getting that to work. That was a non-trivial problem. But let me try to give you sort of a, a feel for what's going on at each point in time. So um, we're, 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 we're at some point in time T, we have some estimate of the context. We have a belief over the different context. We think there's some belief over that the blue context is right. And we've at this point in time only estimated there's one context in the world, but we always assume there might be a novel context. So here is the state of our blue context we've estimated. Here we have the state of a potential novel context, which is always the same. We come into this beginning of this trial with the belief over context. This is the probability of each context given the sensory cue I'm just seeing right now, okay? And so this is the predicted probability is how much I believe I'm gonna be in the blue context or a novel context on this trial. And so we use that to weight these beliefs of these two things to generate the motor command. So effectively I'm working out the weight of the object from these and that's gonna determine my motor command. So what I have at the beginning of the trial based on what I estimated from the previous trial and the sensory cue, 
I can generate a motor command. The motor command then acts on the movement, I get state feedback. And now I can use state feedback to update my belief that I was in the blue context or a novel context. So we go from these predicted things at the beginning of the trial to these basically posteriors, my belief of different contexts, given I've seen now the cue and the state feedback tells me how likely I was. And if it turns out that the novel context is, is, is likely, I will then generate a new context, okay? So if I can't explain it with my current states, then it might be time to generate a new memory. Okay, so that's how memory creation works. So here's a new memory I create, and I spawn that off from the novel context. And finally, I also use these responsibilities to the gate learning. Each of these have to be updated based on errors, and the way I update them depends on these responsibilities. So this model deals with how you express memories. You combine all the memories you've got based on these predictive probabilities. It deals with memory creation, as we'll see in a moment, that if I can't explain the data I'm getting with my current context, I might generate a new memory. And it deals with how you update multiple memories. Um, and inferences used with particle learning. So let me um, give you a toy example of the model because I think it'll make it much more intuitive. Here's a toy example of the model. Here is the data. Here is state feedback, which is gonna be the sensed weight of a number of cups and a sugar bowl. So you experience a number of identical cups. So the sensory cue here, this cue is identical at this point and then becomes something different um, at this point when you see a sugar bowl. And you handle a light cup, number one, then you go to cup two, which is heavier, back to cup one. You experience cup three and maybe you empty the water from cup three and back to cup one and then to the sugar bowl, which weighs the same as cup two. Okay, so this is going to be the input to the model. This is what you get to observe. Of course, you don't really get these precise measurements. You're going to get noisy versions. So we add noise. And so what you're going to get as input are these um, purple dots um, as a function of time. And you're also going to get the sensory cue information. And from that, your job is to do inference given the prize. So the first thing you want to infer is the novel context probability. How probable is it that this novel context explains the data compared to all the context you've got now? And you start off with no memories. So on the very first trial, clearly you can only explain it with a novel context. So you generate a memory, a blue memory. When you come to cup three, again, you generate a new memory because you can't explain that memory with a memory you've got for cup one. Interestingly, when you go to cup two, the novel context probability isn't high enough to generate a new memory. Yet when you go to the sugar bowl, even though it weighs the same as cup two, because it's got a different sensory cue, in this case, you generate a new memory. So you generate the first memory, a second memory, and a third memory. And each time you generate a memory, you have to track the state of that memory. So you start off with just the blue memory. And what I'm showing you here is not just a point estimate. This is a full post there. It's a distribution here. And the blue memory tracks the weight of cup one. When you go to cup two, because you don't generate a new memory, the memory for cup one has to adapt to cup two. So we see it follows the weight of cup two, it goes back for cup one. But now when you go to the red memory, because you generate a new memory, you retain the memory for cup one here, but you generate a new memory for cup two. And similarly, when you go to the sugar bowl, here's the third memory. You can see sort of a gray background here. The gray background is the prior, it's the state for novel contexts. So this shows you how the states um, adapt as you go through the movement. But this isn't what you express on the outside world. What you express in the motor command is a mixture of these based on how much you believe you're in each of these contexts. And that's shown here. This is the predicted probability. Having seen a sensory cue, the cup or the sugar bowl at the beginning of the trial, how much do I believe I'm in the blue context, the red or the orange? Now to start off with, you've only got the blue context, so you express it fully. But now when you generate this red context, you decrease your belief about the blue and increase your belief about the red and so on. And the right thing to do is to multiply this by this to get the um, posterior of the motor output shown in MOVE. And the mean of that is your adaptation. It's what you're going to express. So this is what we should see in behavior, this blue line here. This should what we should see um, expressed and what we're going to fit to the data. And you can see that, you know, it tracks quite nicely here. And then we see slow learning for cup three and so on. But interestingly, when you see this learning for cup three, you might think that means you're learning the weight of that cup slowly. But interestingly, that's not, the tr that's not true. What's actually happening, 
in the model is you learn the weight of the cup really quickly. You can see you've got the weight of the cup in, in your brain or in the model really quickly. What's slow here is that it takes you a long time to believe you're going to stay in that state, in that context. And that's expressive. So we're going to call that apparent learning. It's not a true learning, um, a true learning of the state. It's an apparent learning because what it really represents is a mixing of two learned states. And we can contrast that with what's going on here. We see this learning. Here it's a true learning because it really is a change in state that's driving it. And I'll come back to that in a moment as an important distinction which is sort of overlooked in motor learning between proper learning and apparent learning. And what I'm going to show you is many phenomena in motor control are apparent learning rather than proper learning. And finally, having made your movement, you get state feedback and you can re-estimate these probabilities. And now you can know whether you're in the red or the orange or the blue context. And we're going to use these to, to gate learning. So when the, when the responsibility is high for the red, you update rapidly your beliefs about red. When the responsibility is low, you can't update the red because you're not observing it and it diffuses out. So this does very, deals very nicely with memory creation, memory expression, and memory updating. OK, so now we're going to apply this um, to experimental data, if there are not any questions. Happy to pause for a moment. Okay. Well, before I do, I want to show you three learning curves which come out of the model. So these are three learning curves. Um, so here is um, the training data. So basically, this is what you get to experience, a step change in um, sort of adaptation. So going from, let's say, a P0 to a P plus force field. And here is the learning curve of three different simulations. And what I want to point out is just looking at these learning curves, you can't determine what's proper learning. Only by looking under the hood at the model can you tell. So for example, in this case, what's happening is the participant starts with one context and they adapt that context. Okay, so they adapt that state and they've just expressed just that memory all the way through. So this is full proper learning. You're really updating the state in the system. In contrast, in this simulation, the participant came in with two contexts, a context for one, a context for zero. And what happened is these contexts didn't change, the states didn't change at all. What changes how much they've expressed? There was a reduction in the blue and an increase in the red, and that leads to this curve here. Okay, so this is fully apparent learning. There's no true learning at all. And in most situations, for example, this one, there'll be a mixture. In this case, you started with one uh, context, you generated the second context, and you also slowly transition to it. So there's some proper learning going on here, but also some apparent. So just looking at behavior, it's not easy to determine whether you're looking at proper or apparent or a mixture of the two. And I think that's an interesting question um, for the future. Um, I think I'm going to skip this because it's not that important. I'm going to go to this. Right. Can you elaborate more about gate learning? Uh, gating, le yeah, sure. Um, the, the point is, The point, maybe it's explained here. The, the point is that um, this is this is what um, this is what you actually have in your brain. You've got you know um, you know the P plus force field and let's say a P zero force field, but effectively what determines what you express on the world is your belief those contexts are currently active, which is this plot here. So this is what determines um, how much you're going to express your learning. Um, actually, I think you're talking about the previous thing. How much you express your learning? Oh, let me. Oh. These animations are slow. Sorry, you're talking about gating learning. I'll get back to that. Okay, this is the, this is the, this is the learning part. The, what, what you're actually updating in your brain. So um, this is just about creation. This is what you express. So this isn't learning, and this is about actually updating your beliefs about these different states. And effectively, having made a movement, this says how much do I believe having it now finished the movement that I was in different. Um, context. So I'm, at this point, I think I'm definitely in the red context. And if I'm in the red context, it means I'm going to do a lot of learning of the red state. So you can see this tracks very nicely that. But when it's low responsibility, you're not going to do any learning of the red state because you don't believe you're observing the red state. So you can't really update it. You can see it diffuses out here. So this effectively determines which of the different contexts is going to do the learning. Um, it, it really predicts that all context should learn at any one time in proportion to how much you believe you're in that context. Is that what you were asking? Or if you want, to, you can unmute yourself and ask if I didn't quite get your question. Okay, I'll move on then. Right, I'm going to skip that. 
Okay, okay. so here's, here's an interesting paradigm called spontaneous recovery. Um, so this is the paradigm where you bring people in, you give them some P0. So here's some P0 just moving without a force field. You then give them a block of P plus, um, that's force field acting in one direction. You then give them a small amount of P minus, force in the opposite direction. And the idea is they're going to adapt to P plus, and this will bring them back to close to baseline. And then you put them into a long series of channel trials. So they're just going to be in channel trials where there's nothing to learn, but you can look at what they express in learning. And the interesting thing is when you do that, you see the following data. This is this. You start here. These are only the channel trials I'm showing you, which are interspersed. There's no learning. They now learn to the P+. Plus. We de-adapt them. And in fact, in this case, they came a bit below the baseline. So when they go into the channel trials, you might expect they just drift back to zero. But what happens is they tend to re-express P+. Plus. Okay. So the spontaneous recovery is a transient re-expression of P+, plus, even though all these trials are in the channel, so there's nothing to learn, okay? which is somewhat surprising. And there's a nice model which explains this data um, proposed in 2006, which is a very popular model, which I think I'm going to show you is wrong, but let me tell you about the model. It's called the dual rate model. And what it says is that when you learn these sorts of things, it's not one process learning. They're two separate processes competing to learn this force field. There's a slow process and a fast process. So the output of the model is the combination of a slow process and a fast process. And what the slow process does, the slow process is learns from the error. So this is what this, this is the error you get between your output and the actual force field. And it says, I'm going to learn slowly, but I'm also going to forget slowly. Whereas the fast process has exactly the same form, it just learns quickly and forgets quickly. So if you run this model, what you get is the motor output increases here, goes back to zero, and even though it goes into channel trials here, um, what you find is that it re-expresses the P+. Plus. And if you look at what's happening to the two components, you see the following. The fast component, the green, starts learning first because it's fast, but it also decays away quickly, which means the slow component takes over in red here. And so by the end of learning, it's mostly the slow component which is, it contributes to learning. When you de-adapt quickly, here, it's the fast process which de-adapts. So by the end of the state here, when you've got zero motor output, it's because the slow process is positive and the fast process is equally negative, so they sum to zero. When you go into this channel trial phase, there's no more learning because there's no error anymore. So all you get is decay, but the fast process decays away quickly, revealing the slow process leading to the spontaneous recovery. Okay, so that's the way this is typically explained, this sort of spontaneous recovery phenomenon. So here's the same paradigm run on the coin model. So we run this paradigm on the coin model. And what the coin model does, it starts with one um, context, P0. When it experiences P plus, it generates a new context. And when it generates P minus a third context, by the time it comes to the channel trial phase, it's got three contexts inferred. And importantly, when it goes into the channel trial phase, it knows that the P plus is the most common context it's seen. Okay, it's seen at the longest. So that when it goes into this phase, it actually increases its belief it's in the P plus phase, the red phase. And that leads to an increase um, in the expression of P plus and spontaneous recovery. So in the coin model, we're getting changes in the motor output without changes in the internal state. I mean, the internal states are pretty constant here, but it's really apparent learning driving this. In the dual rate model, Effectively, you can only get changes in the mode output by changing the internal state proper learning. So one way to test between these two is to give the system some strong evidence that P plus has returned. So we run identical paradigm as this, except at the beginning of PC, we give two P plus trials, which in the coin model is strong evidence that P plus has returned and leads to a rapid increase in this probability and what looks much more like what we call a VOC recovery rather than a slow spontaneous recovery leads to a rapid recovery followed by decay. And what we're going to see is the dual rate model can't explain this because in the dual rate model, two P plus trials aren't enough to change the internal states in this way. So, um, Here's our model. Here, here, oh, actually, this isn't the data I wanted to show. Okay, here's the, here's the dual rate. Why is this? This is not the data I wanted. Hold on. Oh, let's go to this slide. Am I still sharing it? Have I lost it? Let me share again. Sorry. Okay. Here here is here are the 
two, two groups of subjects. Here's a group of subjects run on the spontaneous recovery, and here's a group of subjects run on the event recovery. And what I'm showing you here is the fits of the dual rate model. So the dual rate model does a good job of explaining spontaneous recovery, but it really has a qualitative mismatch here for a, a vote recovery. Uh, and the reason is in order to get from here to here, it has to use the fast process, but the fast process also, also decays away quickly. In, in, in contrast, when we fit the coin model to this data, we can see it does a really nice job on both the left and the right. Now, the coin model um, actually, um, oh, have I not got the bick in there? Oh, there we go. Okay. The coin model has got more parameters. I don't know whether you've come across this. So when you're comparing two models, which have different parameters, this one has seven parameters, um, the coin model, and the dual rate has five. In general, when you have more parameters, the fit's going to be better. So we have to penalize that. And the way we do that is we use what's called the Bayesian information criteria. So it, it basically is, uses the likelihood um, of the model, but it also penalizes it by the number of degrees of freedom. So it's a way of comparing models with different degrees of freedom. And when we compare that, we find actually that we do better in the coin model, both in the spontaneous recovery and in the evoked, suggesting that um, context estimation controls memory creation in both ex, ex, um, spontaneous and evoked recovery. Now, I, I just as a teaching point, you know, why should you not yet be convinced the coin is a better model? I mean, I'm telling you the bit you know, fits this nicely and explains it, but really that's not enough to convince someone it's a better model. So we go to quite a lot of effort here. This actually shows individual participants for one of the studies, and this shows the bit for each. So for these six subjects, it, the coin model fits their data better in terms of bit, and for these two subjects, actually the dual rate fits better. And so you might argue, well, you know, for some subjects it's one and some subjects another. So actually the way to do this is to think about what would happen with artificial data. So having to fit our subjects, we can then generate data either using the dual rate model or the coin model. So we basically generate fake data, which we know comes from the dual rate or the coin model. And then we fit those data with both the dual rate and the coin model. And we ask which model is preferred. Okay, and our hope is that you know, everything generated with a coin model is preferred by the coin, everything generated with the dual rate is preferred by the dual rate. That would be great, but that is rarely the case. Okay, so what we see here is when we generate data from the coin model, two thirds of the data is better explained by the coin, but about a third is better explained by the dual rate model. But when we generate data from the dual rate model, all of it is preferred by the dual rate, which is reassuring. So when we see, if we believe this, all this data was generated by the coin, it's not surprising that two subjects are better explained by the dual rate. So effectively, this allows us to have some confidence that effectively, if anything, we're biased towards preferring the dual rate model, which is the model we're sort of attacking, and not biased to assuming the coin model. And this is an important part of a paper to go through. If you're doing model comparison, you want to generate synthetic data and show your technique for model comparison isn't biased. In our case, it is biased, but fortunately it's biased away from the conclusion we want to make. Another way to do um, model comparison, BIC is one way, but it has assumption, is to do cross-validation. Um, and the idea of cross-validation is it gets rid of the problem of the number of parameters. So if you've got different numbers of parameters, what you can do is if you've got an entire data set here, is you leave out a component of the data set, you fit your data to the rest, and then you see how well it can predict the bit you've left out. And in k-fold validation, you basically leave out a case of the data. So if you're doing 10-fold here, you leave out a tenth of the data each time, fit the rest, and then predict this amount. And because you're always predicting from data you haven't fit, effectively you don't have to worry about the number of parameters in each model, it corrects for that. The reason we didn't do this is this requires a lot of fitting of data. And if fitting of data takes a long time, then this is a very computationally expensive way to do things. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Um, so let me get back to this. Okay, um, there's another problem. Um, one problem is that this group of subjects and this group of subjects are different groups, okay? And so we can show the coin model can explain spontaneous recovery in this group of subjects, and it can explain, um, you know, evoke recovery in this group. But if I showed you the parameters for these group subjects, and the parameters for this group and this group are completely different, that would not be a convincing argument for the coin model, because what we should believe is that all participants have roughly the same parameters, but 
that with different paradigms, they do different things. So we go to a lot of effort again to show the parameters. So for example, here are the, all the parameters in the model plotted against the, uh, um, the parameters for the spontaneous evoke. And what you can see is the green and the blue are clustered around each other. So it's not like you have to have different parameters to fit one data set from another data set, which is reassuring. And finally, we do robustness analysis to show that the exact parameters don't affect it. So here, for example, we see spontaneous recovery, and then we can add noise to the parameters, and we can show if we add enough noise, we get rid of it, but you have to add a huge amount of noise to do it. So it's quite robust to the parameters. So um, we can also look at different predictions. So I said that the reason you see spontaneous recovery is because that P plus is the most common thing. So one prediction is if we make P plus even more common by experiencing rather than just this number of trials, adding 400 more trials, the prediction is that we should get greater spontaneous recovery because you should have a greater belief um, that P plus will return. And that's exactly what you see in the data that's shown here. So if you train much more with P plus and then de-adapt, when you go to the channel trial phase, you rebound much higher, which is a nice prediction of the model. And I'm not gonna go through what underlies the model for that. A critical feature of the model is that when you learn something uh, abruptly, you generate a new memory. But a prediction of the model is if you learn something slowly, for example, you may not generate a new memory, you may update a memory. So in fact, experience has been done where you learn a false field abruptly and then de-adapt versus learning it gradually and then de-adapt. And there's a difference. When you learn it abruptly and de-adapt, you de-adapt very quickly. When you learn it slowly, even if you've learned it just as much, you de-adapt rather slowly, okay? And actually that's exactly what the coin model predicts. So here's the simulations of the coin model. In the abrupt case, you de-adapt quickly. In the gradual, you would de-adapt slowly. And we can understand that quite nicely. I mean, ignore this gray bar here. Uh, it just adds complexity. When you adapt abruptly, you generate a new context for the P plus here, okay? And so that you retain your P zero, um, uh, you are in your context P0. So that when you come back to this de-adaptation, you quickly switch back um, to your P0, leading to quick adaptation because you've retained it. So you, you know you're now back in the de-adaptation state. You can see that the blue becomes very high very quickly and you de-adapt. In contrast, in the gradual adaptation, because it's gradual, you basically adapt this context. And when you go back to P0, you generate a new memory for P0 here. However, this P0 memory is now a new memory, so you only slowly change your belief that you're back in P0, and that leads to slow de-adaptation. And this all comes out using the same parameters of the fits I showed earlier. So very nicely, this can explain interesting phenomena of when do you generate a new memory on when do you de-adapt. And someone talked about unlearning yesterday. Um, so you know, here's an example where you sort of unlearn the blue one, whereas here's one where you retain both. So what I've really shown you up till now is examples of where you create memories and how you express memories explaining data. But a crit critical part of this model is that you should update memories um, as well. And typically in an in a updating system, you would update your state estimate based on the previous state estimate and the error based on the Kalman gain, It'll tell you how much to update your belief, okay? And that happens in a single context model. But when you have a multiple context model, things are a bit more complicated. Now you want to update the jth context based on its previous value, not only by the error and the Kalman gain for that, but also about by this responsibility, how much you believe you're actually in that context. So if you're not experienced in that context, you shouldn't update your belief about it because you're not observing it. And so what this model predicts is you should update all your memories in proportion to the responsibility, okay? And that's quite a, a strong prediction. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna test that prediction in a memory updating experiment, okay? So the prediction is all memories should be updated in proportion of their responsibility. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna try and create two memories or two contexts in the participant's brain. We're gonna create a P plus context associated with a sensory Q1 and a P minus context associated with sensory Q2. And the sensory Qs one and two are actually the um, control points in the object I talked about earlier. So effectively they got to experience a positive force field when controlling the left control point and a negative when controlling the right. And we randomly interleave these two for lots of trials. 
so that they'll learn the two false fields. And we know they'll learn them because I showed you earlier that they can learn the two false fields and they're gonna use this information. So having learned these two contexts, we then want to ask how much do you update your state of one of those contexts depending on a single trial. And so the way we do this is we're going to give people a single trial of learning, um, either a P1 plus or a P2 minus, so things they've experienced before, or we're gonna give them a something which is a mixture of the two. We can give them a P plus with sensory Q2 or a P minus with sensory Q1. So there's the four possible things we're gonna ask them. And we want to ask how much does it update your memory for context one? And the way we do that is we look at what's happening in the memory for context one by giving a channel trial with a sensory Q1. So we measure what's in your memory for context one by using this. We give a single exposure trial and then we probe again the adaptation level for that uh, sensory Q in a channel trial. So basically because we're showing the sensory Q for one, we're only probing um, one of the memories and we have four different things here. Okay, so we're looking at single trial learning for that one thing. And we can look at the predictions. So here are the predictions of what should happen. This shows you before you move your prior belief about what context you should be in in this exposure trial. Well, since you haven't experienced the force because you haven't moved yet, all you have is a sensory cue, either the one or the two. If you see the sensory cue one, in this case or this case, you should have a high belief you're in context one. If you see the sensory cue two, you should have a low belief you're in, um, in, the, in the context two. So that's the prior before you move. Having moved, you experience the force field. And if you experience the plus force field, that's the one which is associated with context one. So if you experience the plus, you should have a high likelihood that you're in context one. If you experience the minus, you should have a low likelihood. So combining the prior and the likelihood, hopefully you've done this already with Conrad, you get the posterior. This shows you how much you should update your memory as a function of the different combinations. It should be most for this, P1 plus, least for P2 minus, and intermediate for these two. Um, and there is a reason why this one's harder than that, which I won't go into. And that's exactly what we see in the data. This shows the data of how much you update from this trial to this based on these four. And this really shows this beautiful graded updating, suggesting that you're updating your memory in proportion to how much you believe that memory is appropriate in that situation. And because this experiment is completely symmetrical, even though we're not probing P2 minus, we know that the exact same must be happening for this other context or the converse. And this really is strong evidence that you're updating multiple memories at the same time in proportion to their responsibilities. Okay, um, I know that was a complicated experiment. Okay, so sort of in the last few minutes, let me just show you some classical paradigms <clears throat> and how the coin model explains them. So in all of these, we take the data from all the subjects I fitted in the previous paradigms, all 40, and now we're gonna fix those and just make parameter-free predictions. We're not gonna fit any data anymore. We're just gonna say, simulate 40 subjects and average their data to see what happens in these paradigms. And a classic paradigm is savings. Savings is when you experience something once, if you come back to it a second time, you learn it faster. So here, if you do the following paradigm, you do a spontaneous recovery paradigm shown here, and then you repeat it again. What you find is the second time you learn it showing just these phases here, you learn it faster the second time. <clears throat> and this is often taken as evidence that you somehow increased your learning rate of this um, the second time. The coin model makes, predicts this data as well. But interestingly, there's no change in the learning rate. So the Kalman gain, which is a measure of learning rate, is the same both times. And actually the state, um, internal state, is the same both times. What's different in the model is your belief that you're in a new context. This is your belief that you're in a new context increases faster the second time. So when you experience this the second time, you're more willing to believe that you're going to stay in that context and if you express it more. So this actually is apparent learning, this effect. Um, the fact you're expressing things more rather than the actual internal learning is different. A similar thing happens in anterograde interference. So anterograde interference is where the longer you learn um, a P plus force field, the harder it will be to learn a P minus. Um, and that's shown here. So the longer you learn this one, the harder it is to learn the opposite. It's actually easier to see in this. But in fact, if you just learn P minus in black, it's fast. But as you learn P plus for longer and longer, it's slower and slower to learn P minus. Again, we reproduce this behavior. Again, there's no difference in the learning rates or, or the states. What's different is your predicted probabilities. Basically, the longer you learn P plus, 
the less willing you are to believe you're going to move into a different force field. Because I've experienced this for a long time, I don't think that I'm going to move into a different force field and therefore it's harder to learn it. So again, this is an apparent learning effect that you're not willing to express the learning, even though you've learned it equally well. You actually have in your head P minus equally well for each of those, you're just not expressing it equally well. And finally, this is a nice example from a, a science paper a number of years ago, which looked at volatility. So if you experience a force field which switches rarely versus a force field which switches rapidly, and then look at a single trial learning, what you find is if you're in a force field which switches frequently, that the amount of learning you get to a single trial increases, whereas the amount of learning you get in this environment decreases. And the idea was that maybe you increase your learning rate when you're in stable environments and decrease your learning rate in unstable environments. What we find in our model that we qualitatively reproduce this, but again, there's no difference in learning rate at all or the amount of learning you see in these. It's all driven by the prediction that the force field will stay to the next trial. The idea is that in this situation, you think anything you experience is likely to stay. So if I learn something on a trial, I should express it on the next trial because it's likely to stay around. And therefore I express it a lot, this is the expression. Whereas here, if I learn something on a single trial, it's unlikely to be there on the next trial because I might switch to a different context and therefore I shouldn't express it. And that's what gives you this. So again, all this phenomena is driven by apparent learning again, that effectively in all these situations, the internal state and the learning is identical all the reasons for this is driven by your belief about what context you might be in. Um, I think I might skip implicit and implicit. I feel that I've maybe lost people. I might let people ask questions. Does anyone have any questions or want to go over any of that again? Let me pause. Did I lose everyone? That's all. <laughs> I think I did there. <laughs> Uh, let's let's see if uh, there are any raised hands. Yeah, any raised hands. Uh, but in the meanwhile, yeah, I'm just wondering. I mean, this could be a generic model, not only for motor memories, yes, but for any perception in general, right? Yes, we we, are, we, are, we agree. I think so. Remember, we're writing a review paper um, where we're trying to make links between this and between other forms of learning, reinforcement learning, perceptual learning, cognitive learning. So people have applied these sorts of models, these switching models to perceptual learning. They don't tend to have the states changing. So they're, they're just learning much simpler things. But we think we can sort of think about unifying other forms of learning under this. So we're excited about that. So in the paper, we do end by saying this model is appropriate in motor learning and beyond. Um, so I think it's general learning um, that they're different. You know, you're in different contexts. Um, so, you know, all the conditioning work, for example, where, you know, you learn something in one, you know, one cage and you test in another cage, that all falls under this. So we're mm -hmm. excited about that. There are many features still lacking from this model. You can make this model arbitrarily complex. So one thing about this model that only generates new memories, there's no idea of pruning memories or merging memories. And so we're mm -hmm. interested in the idea that maybe through sleep, you reorganize memories you've got. Um, that might be useful. Um, so there's lots of things, but, but honestly, this was complicated enough for us. It took us enough time on the simple version to get it to work. Um, any hands raised? No. Like, uh, I'm tempted to skip the explicit. This is, this is just for, for the aficionados. Let me just go to, let me sum up. How do I go to slide? Here we go. Yep. I'm going to summarize and then if no questions we can all finish early or they can ask questions so i mean so the, as you say there, 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 there are actually quite a lot of models which have looked at various things so i've talked about the spontaneous event recovery memory updating this is savings integrated inference environmental consistency we also have a model of explicit and implicit learning I, I probably won't go over unless someone really wants me to and you know there are a bunch of single context models dual rate and memory of errors and they fail at various ways there are also quite a lot of uh, multiple context models and in fact the dpkf model by gershman is actually the closest to us um, although it fails at many of the things and only the coin can explain that and i think part of the reason is that you know, what we have in the generative model is relatively unique in that, you know, lots of them don't model state dynamics or don't model context transitions, or they have no centric cues, or they're not hierarchical, or they assume number of contexts are known. And in our inference, several of these only update a single or express a single memory. So I think it's really crucial that we express multiple memories um, and also update multiple memories. And learning parameters online is also very important. So um, I, I've covered a bit about the rules for motor memories. 
about the coin model. It's principled in that it's Bayesian. So, you know, once you specify the generative model, there's no more fine tuning or complex things to be done. And, um, and uh, it's comprehensive in a sense that we incorporated all sources of information. I mean, this is all you have is state feedback and sensory cues. And that's all sorts of information. We can make them more complicated. They're only, only scalar at the moment. And sensory cues at the moment are sort of um, uh, categorical. And it unifies many different data sets, which is good. And it clarifies the difference between apparent and proper learning. Um, I've got a question. Please, can the link to the model be given? It would really help. Do you mean the, 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 to simulate the model? Is that what you're asking for? Um, if you go to the Nature paper, which was published yesterday, it has a link to um, the code, MATLAB code, to, for the model. Um, and so we've released that model, it's, it's on a GitHub, um, and it allows you to both um, simulate and fit data. Um, so please go and try it out on any data you have. Um, we'd love to know what you think of it. And I'm happy to take yes, there's a question. If you unmute yourself, I can brush Ali. Oh. Rashali, are you able to unmute yourself? You did just let me ah, Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Hi, Daniel, fantastic, fantastic talk. Uh, so I, I had a question, probably a very stupid one. Uh, so uh, when you were comparing the coin versus dual state model, and you give the, the 2XP context, uh, I'm not quite sure I understand why would there still be a DK? So when there is a recovery, there was a DK, but if let, it's let, a let me go back to it. Let's just, just, yeah. sorry, just make sure I understand what you're saying. Uh, so, oh, I've, oh, silly me. I've, I know I shouldn't. I've, I have to probably share it again, don't I? You can see that. So, you, what, what was the question? Just say the question again. Sorry. So, uh, when you were comparing the coin versus dual state model. Yep. yep and then, yep. yeah. And you give this 2XP. So, uh, so, in the coin model, why would there still be a decay? This decay here. Yeah. Uh, so ah, it, okay. Okay. Yes. Because it, in, our, in our state, um, if you remember the state equations, the state was the previous state plus some retention parameter A. Um, okay, so times A. And so you've learned that things tend to decay. So basically your prior is that A tends to decay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. But yeah, I that so, part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically uh, both models have a sort of decay term in them, um, which is classically put into these state-space models. Interestingly, mm -hmm. the reason it doesn't decay to zero here is because it also mm -hmm. learned there's, there's a bias. So it, remember there's a bias in it. So basically the bias right. and the decay cancel out. So it goes to some non-zero asymptote here so ah, that's why okay. it decays uh, similarly you know this model decays but in order to jump from here to here it has to use the fast and the fast has a, has a fast right, the fast decays fast yeah yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay thank you great any other questions people a minute since there's no questions right up oh, we'll see people are tired at the end of two weeks <laughs> <laughs> that's all right there don't need to be questions if there aren't any I, I i will let you all go early is that allowed yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> vijay is that okay yeah, yeah. I mean, there are no questions. Uh, Daniel, would you be okay to engage with Slack if people put up? Yeah, sure. If people have questions, just put them in the Slack channel or email me. I'm happy to answer. But yeah. please, I mean, if someone, I mean, if someone did email me after yesterday saying they didn't want to ask in public. But you know, if you don't, if you've got a question, probably everyone wants to know the answer. <laughs> so <laughs> feel to be brave to ask a question now if you like, rather than secretly doing it in Slack, because <laughs> then everyone learns. But I'm happy to answer in Slack. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoy your last day with Conrad. Um, I think he's going to teach you more Bayesian stuff today. Great. Yeah, I think that's that's the plan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye thank you. Okay, thank you, thank Daniel. You. That was awesome. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Bye -bye. Daniel. Wonderful. Thanks a lot.